Okay, Rich, I think we're going to start if you'd like to go live on the YouTube channel. Good evening. I'm Cheryl Roberts, director of the Greenberger Center for Social and Criminal Justice. On behalf of the Greenberger Center and Norman Rockwell Museum, we would like to welcome you to the night's program, Art for Justice. Please note that we are recording this program. Our aim this evening is to have a conversation about social justice, which leads to hope, action, and ultimately to change. Because of the power of a picture to say a thousand words all at once, we hope that the change we seek tonight does not take a week or a month or a year to take hold, but rather that it begins to take hold this very night and starts to bear fruit even as soon as tomorrow, because for too many, like Eric Garner, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd, the time for change has come too late. For others, like my cousin's son, that change cannot come soon enough. The other day, he said, I want to be a police officer because then I won't get hurt. I know it's a dangerous job, but if I don't become a police officer, they will say I am a criminal. They will think I am bad and I will be hurt. He is African-American. He's also six and a half years old. For him, change must happen now. And that is where art comes in because art 
has the power to change one's perspective, one's heart and mind in an instant. And there is not even one more instant to wait or waste. So tonight, as you will learn, Norman Rockwell's work opened the eyes of his time, just as Pop Peterson's reimagining of Rockwell's work is opening the eyes of new generations, just in the nick of time. I hope for all six-year-olds. And now it's my privilege to introduce our panelists in alphabetical order, followed by our moderator. It's my pleasure to introduce Francis Greenberger first, my friend and mentor and collaborator at the Greenberger Center, which we founded in 2014 to help justice-involved people living with mental illness and substance use disorders. Francis also founded Time Equities, a multinational real estate firm more than 50 years ago, and Art Only in Ghent, New York more than 25 years ago. And among his other accomplishments, he is very pleased to be president of the board of New York Edge, the largest after-school service provider for public school kids in New York City. Lori Norton Moffat has been director and CEO of Norman Rockwell Museum for more than 30 years. She's a leading Rockwell scholar and author and oversaw the expansion of the museum, which opened in 1993. Since then, she has literally traveled the world representing the museum, including to Washington DC in July of 2011, where she met with President Barack Obama at his invitation when Norman Rockwell's painting, The Problem We All Live With, was on loan from the museum to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Ruby Bridges' integration of her elementary school. Pops Peterson is a writer who has been published in Andy Warhol's interview, Essence, The Village Voice, and the New York Times. And he has also written stage plays and screenplays for television and film. He is also, of course, an artist and public speaker, best known for his reimagining Rockwell, which includes images we will see later tonight. His full series is on display at the museum until May 31st. We hope you'll take the time to see it in person. The museum is open by reservation, so please do contact the museum. I'm sure a link will appear in the chat soon. And finally, our moderator, Roberta McCulloch Dews is Director of Administrative Services and Public Information Officer with the Mayor's Office of the City of Pittsfield in Massachusetts. She is also on the board of Norman Rockwell Museum and you might even catch a glimpse of her later tonight engaged in her other moonlighting work. So thanks to our panelists and Roberta, thank you so much for moderating. It's now my pleasure to turn this program over to you. Thank you, Cheryl, for that warm introduction and good evening, everyone. We're absolutely delighted that you have joined us for this conversation. We're sure that it's gonna be a dynamic meeting of the minds. So tonight, as you heard, we're going to talk about art as it pertains to social justice. And boy, are there a lot of issues to talk about. I wanna set the stage with the following statement, as well as a few questions for you to think about. Through the democratic process, Americans have the potential to bend the arc of justice towards a kinder America, where the structural racism and the inequity baked into our public systems, including our schools, our prisons, and housing is ultimately dismantled. So a few questions for you to think about. How can art help? In what ways do images help us understand our personal experiences, our fears, hopes, history, and larger cultural narratives. What calls to action do these images invite? Don't worry about remembering them all. We're gonna add them to the chat. But as you can see, we have given you a lot to think about tonight. At a base level, we know that art speaks to the individual and like beauty, it's in the eye of the beholder. Art generates a reaction and powerful art generates even more of it. So the illustrated images that you will see tonight will be a juxtaposition of the then and now. Each image is rife with historical intentional context. Norman Rockwell's illustrations for the Saturday Evening Post and Look Magazine tell a very distinct story. Pops Peterson's artwork builds on this legacy of intentionality in a powerful way that speaks to the social issues of today. So tonight, we're gonna to center our conversation around five sets of images. With each set, we will have a few seconds to view them, take them in, and then we'll have some brief insights shared by Lori Norton Moffat and Pops Peterson. 
So I encourage you all to trust what you see, but also be open to more. We welcome your questions, your comments, your thoughts. So please throughout the process or the, 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 the order of operations of this conversation, add them to the chat because we want it to be dynamic and we want to hear from you. We welcome your curiosity. So now let's get started. The first images on the screen are that of freedom from fear and freedom from what? So let's just take a few minutes right now to take them in and look at the images closely and think about what you see and think about what you don't see. And then followed by our analysis, we'll hear from Lori Norton Moffitt. All right, Lori, would you like to share some thoughts? Thank you, Roberta, and good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to have so many gathered around this topic tonight. Uh, such impress uh, important, pressing uh, work to do in the world, and we celebrate artists tonight who make a difference in uh, helping us see the world and move towards social change. And this is what Norman Rockwell was doing in this picture from 1943, one of his four freedom series, which articulated President Roosevelt's ideal of a free world, a world where people were free from fear from their government, where they were free to speak their mind, worship as they wished. And it was an aspirational vision to inspire America to step into the war in Europe and defend freedom, which was under assault by the Nazi forces, by Japan. Uh, the world was uh, really in conflagration. Notably, these freedoms were not enjoyed by all citizens at home. They were not enjoyed by African-American citizens, by people of color, and they were certainly not enjoyed by Af uh, Japanese American citizens, many of whom were interned during World War II in Japanese American concentration camps. So this was an aspirational vision. It was imperfect. Uh, it was a goal to defend the goals of our constitution but it was certainly not achieved during its time. Thank you, Lori. All right, Pops, let's hear from you. Thank you so much everyone for inviting me to this uh, panel. I'm, I'm totally grateful for this opportunity to um, present my work to, to all you people who so graciously come to watch. Um, freedom from what was my answer to freedom from fear, of course, when I did this, I was just starting with my series. And uh, originally all I really wanted to do was walk through Rockwell's steps again and, and just show how things had changed. Um, new technologies, hairstyles, clothing, et cetera. But um, it took on a little different, a deeper meaning when I wanted to get my feelings about the world into the pictures as well. So I'd only done a few pictures when I did this image, which is actually my first time in a studio ever. And I shot it on my iPhone. Um, but I wanted to show that as free and as comforted as we were in during the World War II, that there were no bombs falling on our land. Um, the newspaper that the father is holding is talking about the Blitzkrieg. And uh, it's showing that in America, we're doing so well, we will never have to worry about that on our shores. But I wanted to show that even now in other neighborhoods, maybe people don't have that comfort um, to know that everything is all right and um, they don't have to worry every time they step outside their door. I have a different headline on my paper. It says, I can't breathe, which were the last words of Eric Garner when I did this back in 2015, it really spoke to um, the police brutality and the inequity of the day. Last thing I ever imagined or wished for would be for this headline to come back into the, into the spotlight, which of course everyone knows haven't this year. Um, so, this picture has actually become one of my most recognized pictures. It's been widely published, it's in textbooks, it's been in the New York Times, the Boston Globes, et cetera. And um, it started me on, on trying to really make an impact with my work and I've seen it as people 
will tell me how it moved them. Thank you, Pops. And, and I, I see that you are getting emotional. And I think that it's pretty hard not to get emotional as we think about um, the, what these images evoke and the meaning behind it. And especially the, the, the fact that we know that it's so connected to the reality that so many people um, within the black community and so many others are experiencing. So it is a reaction that there are so many who um, would, um, would experience along with you. So, oh, and I, think note, we, um, I have a wonderful model in this image. <laughs> <laughs> Roberta oh. McCulloch Dews is the mother in this image. And uh, it was just a magical night because we'd never met until that night when that she drove right. with her family. That I'd never right. met them. They drove at night through a snowstorm because it was so important. That is right. And, and, and to your point, Pops, we didn't imagine that we would be here again. And um, there is a stay in power to this work. And so that's something to think about how these images can just, you know, um, have impact in perpetuity. Um, so let's think about that. And also let's give space for where we need to take a breath and breathe, especially when things might get a little bit um, um, difficult. Um, I just wanna move on right now to the problem that we all live with and the problem persist. If we could see the next set of images, please. All right, so as those images are coming up, um, I know that that's going, thank you so much. Awesome, the power of technology. Don't you just love it? It moved with the sound of my voice. All right, so let's just take a minute to um, take in these images. And I don't know if some of you guys are on Twitter or have social media accounts, but uh, the problem we all live with, there was a juxtaposition of that and our Madam Vice President that has been all over Twitter and social media today. Um, so how far we've come and how far we still have to go. So let's take a look at these images and um, take them in. All right, Lori, would you like to share some thoughts? Thank you, Roberta. The image on the left, the problem we all live with was painted by Norman Rockwell. Uh, to commemorate the 10th anniversary of the Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court ruling that uh, ruled that all schools must be integrated, separate was not equal. And there, and 10 years later, Look Magazine was looking at how is the country doing around uh, making equal education for all. Norman Rockwell was 70 years old when he painted this picture. He had spent a lifetime working for the Saturday Evening Post. And in the 1960s, during the civil rights movement, he was fired up and motivated to move to Look Magazine that had a much more progressive editorial point of view and was looking at the current events of the day. This picture depicts Ruby Bridges, the young girl from New Orleans who was the first black child to integrate her elementary school, the William Franz Elementary School uh, in New Orleans. She was the only child in her class that year. All of the white students moved out of the school. Their parents pulled them out of the school and Ruby was taught all by herself from a teacher from Boston, Barbara Henry, who uh, wrote, who Yield, uh, followed the call for a teacher for this classroom and she and Ruby became friends and Ruby actually became friends, lifelong friends with the marshals in this picture. The marshals were necessary to escort her safely to school. And the graffiti we see on the wall, the repugnant graffiti, the tomatoes thrown, these were uh, emblems of the epithets hurled at Ruby as she walked to school, as her mother and the marshals protected her to get her safely to school. And it was one of the most poignant images of its time. Norman Rockwell used his voice for social change. He was a beloved artist by millions of Americans at this point in his career when many people would be thinking of retiring. And it was the first painting he did for Look Magazine and he used his trusted voice to push for social change and a more equitable world. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Pops? 
Would you share your insights, please? When I first had the idea for the series, I was just thinking about how much fun it was all going to be to make these home, home, uh, <laughs> these um, home worthy, what do you call it? American landscape home pictures. And um, when this, when the Ferguson riots happened, I had an epiphany, I decided that I, I really had to address this issue. I knew that I had to do this image if I wanted to do a Rockwell series. And I was planning to find a young girl and have a white dress made and get some costumes and uh, for the marshals and, and do something with it. I didn't know quite what, but it would be done in the studio. But then the Ferguson riots came and um, I was so upset by everything because when I was in high school was when Martin Luther King was killed and there were riots in Harlem and I had to take the subway and go to high school to study art in Harlem. And it was just such a frightening time and so depressing. And I was so sure that things would change and everything would be great. You know, certainly by the time I became an old man and 50 years had gone by before that riot happened and it brought it all back. And I was just so upset. I just threw out my plans to go into the studio. And I was, you know, I didn't know what copyright laws might be involved if I would actually lift an image off a Rockwell picture, but I just really didn't care at that point. I had to make my, I had to make my message, my statement. So I did this, um, I will spend sometimes months or even years planning a, a large picture or one of my, my, one of my pictures and pulling it all together. But this one I did in about four or five hours because I was just so upset. I just, I just uh, couldn't wait to get in the studio. So I got four or five images of the devastation from Ferguson off the internet and I mashed them together with the original Rockwell image. And my, what, what meant so much to me is that Everyone was talking about, was the cop a murderer who started the riot? Was the guy who got shot a thief? You know, what was the spark of the riot and who was right and who was wrong, which to me was so incredibly shallow. And to this day, I do not ever recall seeing. It's okay, Pops. Take anyone talking about the kids. Yeah. Who had to walk to school through a yeah. war zone? Yeah. About all the people who lost their their livelihoods, their businesses, mm. their place of work, their life fortunes. Nobody goes back to follow up with that. The media yeah. is only interested in where is the fire right now? Where is the bullet right now? As soon as soon as the fire stops, they are gone to the next fire. And uh, I just wanted to show that riots will come and go, but Oh, I, I, I think Pops, and thank you again for your vulnerability. I think, you know, in both Lori's analysis and, you know, the, the, the fact that in the face of such ugliness, we saw even the, the friendships forged with the Marshalls and, and, and Little Ruby Bridges, and we see that humanity can shine through. But we also see that in the case of the problem persists that the more things change, the more they stay the same. So we have a yeah, ways to go. My focus is on the we girl do. because we, she's we still do. going to get her. She's still going to get her education. A absolutely. You know, nothing's going to stop her. A a and absolutely, a absolutely, and you know, I and I think that again, the power of these images and the things that stay with us and the things that evoke the emotion. We do have another set of images that I'd like to, for us to turn our attention to right now. Um, the runaway and um, the Stockbridge Fire Department. And, you know, we are shifting our gaze toward um, a, a little bit of a, a difference here. So let's take some time to take it in and then we'll have our analysis by Lori. All right, Lori, would you like to share your thoughts? Thank you, Roberta. When this picture was painted by Norman Rockwell and published on the cover of the Saturday Evening Post in 1958, it likely had very different 
interpretations and impressions uh, depending on who one was in America. And certainly today that would be the case. I think many people would have viewed this picture as a young boy experiencing what so many children do when they get angry at their parents and uh, decide they're just going to run away and they're going to strike out and be independent. And you see his bindle on the floor, that's the name of his hobo stick and bandana with his cherished possessions. And he has left home and this was a time where he could feel safe doing so. And the policeman in this picture is kindly, and you see the very experienced, older soda jerk behind the counter. They're looking at the young boy and they're remembering their own young dreams. And one has the sense that this is a picture of safety. There's pie in the, the pie safe on the wall and they're probably giving him a piece of pie and convincing him that life at home would surely be a lot better than running away and, uh, exploring his, his dreams and his independence. The picture viewed from today when uh, police brutality and policing of uh, black Americans and white Americans can be a very different experience. And the idea that running away today could be safe for any child, I think is a, a very different life moment from uh, 1958, 1960, when this was painted. So we're talking uh, 60 years, 60 plus years later. And there are timeless elements in this, but there are, time, there are ways that our society has diverged in um, terrible, terrible ways, unsafe ways. And we are really dealing with a moment during the Black Lives Matter movement and a, a, a moment of, uh, many people, especially um, children and, and people of African-American descent do not feel safe with the police. So I think this is an example of a picture that changes over time and is caught in a moment um, of time that wasn't safe then either um, for people of color. And it's an example where the published media of its day was featuring one side, one facet of America and not giving attention and um, safety during the, the Jim Crow era and just the pre-civil rights moment that this preceded. Thank you, Lori. Pop, would you share your thoughts? This is one of my earliest in the series. Um, as I said, I wanted to just go around town and find the same locations and and recreate what Rockwell did just to walk in his shoes. And so I was very happy to do this because I, it's such a happy idea. I wanted to show the difference between then and now and that in Stockbridge, we do have here and there people of color. Um, we have women who have gone into roles of authority. Um, we have women uh, in the police department and the fire department. And, um, that's basically what I wanted to do. Um, I actually had intended to have a, a female police officer, but the police department was afraid that the museum might sue them if I, if I did a picture and had a cop uniform in it. So um, the model, Heidi Teusch, um, actually knew the guy who was uh, the head of the fire department. So we got a fire person's, a firefighter's uniform. So I called the Stockbridge Fire Department to the rescue because the Stockbridge Fire Department actually rescued the picture. Um, the picture is also very interesting because the little boy on the left grew up to be our soda jerk on the right, that's Ed Locke. So that's just, that was another fabulous thing that I was able to do to show how time actually did affect um, a real person. And uh, I just thought this picture is just, um, just so full of joy. And you know, the kid has run away, but the fire lady here has befriended him. That's her hat that he's wearing. And you can tell the way everybody's looking that everybody else is, she's just gonna take him home. Thank you, Pops. Thank you, Lori. And isn't that awesome that the model was able to come back into this image? I, I knew there was a resemblance and I had an inkling and I'm like, thank you for confirming that because I'm like, it looks kind of familiar. Um, but yes, I, I think that again, both sides um, powerful and um, many would agree. Uh, and many would long for that same kind of connection that is visible in um, Rockwell's image um, and hope for it in today's time. So thank you both 
we're going to move to freedom of speech and what the hell. All right, let's take some time to take it in. All right, Lori, you're up. Thank you, Roberta. Uh, this is one of the most symbolic, emblematic of Norman Rockwell's works. It was uh, published in 1943 in the Saturday Evening Post and uh, illuminated one of President Roosevelt's ideals that freedom of speech would preserve, be preserved for everyone anywhere in the world. And of course, this is a bedrock principle of our constitution, uh, First Amendment right, that everyone is free to speak their mind without fear. And in this picture, I just would like to point out the cameo appearance of Norman Rockwell in the far upper left, you see just his eye peeking out. But I think if you look at this painting, you'll notice a few things. It represents a town hall meeting, a great New England tradition. Uh, we, I love our town meeting night in Stockbridge. And in this particular town meeting in Arlington, where Vermont, where Norman Rockwell lived at the time, you'll see that most of the attendees were men. They were white men. Most of them are in their business suits and white shirts and ties. And the speaker is clearly portrayed as a working class man. You see the, he was a mechanic. You see the grease under his fingernails. You see his plaid shirt. You see him standing in a very Lincoln-esque style where one of Norman Rockwell's heroes, President Abraham Lincoln, where he stands up to speak his mind. And he had a different point of view than all of the participants in this meeting who were intent on building a new high school. The high school in Arlington had burnt to the ground and um, these very civic minded citizens wanted to build a new school, but it was going to raise the taxes in a bond issue. And this young man stood up courageously and spoke against the building of a new school and said, it's perfectly fine for us to merge high schools with our neighboring town of West Arlington, because if my taxes are raised, I will not be able to afford to live here and sustain my business. And he very courageously stood up and spoke uh, his mind in this meeting safely and uh, with respectful listening. And I think that's what I particularly love about this picture is everyone is listening. And there's one woman in the audience. Uh, I think we've seen that change in our government and uh, town meetings and in our nation's elected officials, but the, the predominant voters that evening were men, the, the fathers and the family. So times have changed, but the core bedrock principle of our nation, our first amendment rights are expressed here in freedom of speech. Thank you, Lori. Pops, you're up. Uh, that is a great story, Lori, which I had never heard and uh, it was beautiful. So thank you for that. My story um, is based on my own experience at the town hall because I wanted to recreate the marriage license picture, another famous iconic Rockwell image. And I wanted to shoot it in town hall where they give out the marriage licenses. So I had to go and get a permit and what I saw just was just so, so, there was so much frustration, there was so much bureaucracy, there was so much nitpicking, and it was just, I just couldn't believe it. And so I had my, my protagonist, a black woman, somebody who you would imagine had been, you know, represents a marginalized fraction of our society. And she finds out that all she's ever wanted is to have a voice in the system and to be accepted and have her voice heard. But then what the reality of it is you get in there and you're in the system and you find out the system is basically a quagmire, even in a tiny little town. So um, many people take this to mean other, you know, more bigger things. So like she is like a black woman just representing all black people going, where is mine? Where is my justice? Where is my freedom? Where is it? That's what uh, many people take it to mean. And actually, I do mean that. But the reality of it is like, this is a system. I've been waiting to get into the system my whole life. And here I am. And it's like, this? I can't believe it. What the hell? So that's the story. 
And uh, I got, these are all my friends, everybody in my pictures, basically, they're all local people. So this is one of my first big productions with lots of people. And they were all so happy to come and, and help me make this a reality. So I just got to thank all my models again for um, all the encouragement. Everybody has just been wonderful in this series. Thank you both. So I'm impressed because we went through our analysis like with lightning speed. So kudos to both of you because you gave both thorough um, you know, insights into the images. Um, but now we have reached a point of our conversation where we really wanna have a discussion. And I wanna pivot a little bit back to um, some of those questions we asked in the very beginning. And we're also gonna have an opportunity for um, the attendees to weigh in as well. But I'd like to open up the questions to the panel. And we can start with, you know, how can art help? And, you know, we have the follow-up question that said, in what ways do images help us understand our personal experiences, fears, hopes, history, and larger cultural narratives? So there's a lot to unpack, but if any of you want to tackle one question, be my guest. Uh, I would like to speak Here, from my Francis incredible experience. Lori, you want to go first? I no, just... I wanted to invite Francis to offer some perspective since you and I have just had a moment to share about the artwork and maybe ask that question of Francis. And Absolutely, then... Francis. We'd love well, to hear from you. I mean, I, I, think, uh, I think we've seen it um, just in tonight's discussion and, and in Pop's work. And, uh, um, uh, it, it expresses all kinds of things that um, uh, in, our, in our normal lives, we might not fully understand. Um, you know, one of the things that we got, that was expressed tonight as a result of um, understanding and looking at these uh, works of art, um, both Pops and Rockwell's uh, is, uh, um, you know, one of the, one of, we talked about this previously, one of the things that Brian Stevenson says about changing the world is that you need to get uh, um, up, up close, you have to get close to the poor and the oppressed. And in a way, this uh, transforms us, takes us into that picture. And, you know, if we think about the one where, um, um, the mother is is looking at the father, and the father's. I mean, she looks sort of at in in the in, in the Rockwell picture. The mother's looking at her children, and the father's kind of sort of proudly and securely looking over. But in Pop's picture, the mother is looking at at the father with sort of anxiety and wondering what or feeling his his fear, and he's looking out the window. Uh, um, and, and, and feeling a sense of ominous about what's out there. So by, by being close uh, to these uh, um, individuals, um, in a way you could say oppressed by, by racial bias, um, uh, we, we understand their experience in a different way than uh, we, we might on a more abstract basis. And I think that one of the things that's occurring in the narrative generally today is that we're not only standing, we're not only understanding how uh, the history of, of, of bias has affected the sort of daily lives and the education, the practical aspects of uh, people who have, have been oppressed, uh, but also the emotional talk a toll uh, um, that it is, of course, exerted on them, but that wasn't always evident as, uh, um, as people thought about it and talked about it in the past. So I think uh, um, there's so much coming out of these images that, uh, that really informs and transforms our experience and understands in greater dimension the effect of of the, uh, um, of the of the of the oppression and, and and what how important it is to change it. That's a good point, Francis. Thank you. Um, absolutely. Uh, I you know 
I guess I'm a little bit biased because I, I wasn't in, in um, freedom from what and the whole posture, even my posture, my posture is that of uncom I'm uncomfortable, right? And I'm on edge. And, and I think many of us today, when we think about the social issues that um, are at the forefront, we're always on guard, we're always on edge. Um, we did have a question in the chat. We have a couple of questions, but um, one question in the chat, why is the father so, um, so much larger than others in the room? And I, I take it this would be for um, maybe uh, freedom from what? Although in freedom from fear, the father is tall as well. Um, Pops, was that intentional to make the, um, the father's um, the same, similar height and, 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 and heft? Well, um, in reality, that was an NBA player. So he's tall, <laughs> you know? That's Eric Williams, he used to play for the Celtics. That's the answer. Okay, there you go. And, and that man is not my husband. He is no. a model, he is a stand-in. <laughs> Your husband's in the last picture we're gonna see later. Yes, um, we do have another question that came in to the chat. How optimistic are you that this country is ready to face history and accept meaningful change? Who would like to take you that? Know, I, I heard uh, our former governor, Deval Patrick speak uh, just a couple of weeks ago and it was a panel talking about the current moment and the struggles we're having in our nation and uh, how much we rue that we have not come far enough, that we've lost ground since the civil rights movement. We had tremendous hope at the time, but he told a searing personal story of his family driving from the south side of Chicago down to Kentucky to see his family when he was a child. They piled in a car and into the car, they brought the picnic hamper of food. And he said they brought a jar an empty jar. And he told the story that his family did not know where they would be able to stop to buy food safely. They did not know where they would be able to stop and get a drink of water safely when uh, drinking fountains were separated by white and colored. And they did not know where they would be able to stop and uh, do their personal biological needs and avoid uh, safely. And they had to plan their family trip around all of these concepts of not feeling safe as they moved farther south in this country and not feeling necessarily safe in places in the north. We were just coming out of Jim Crow and he talked about the ways our country has changed that uh, Black and white people could not marry. Miscegenation was against the law. Uh, we'll talk maybe later about um, gay marriage and how far we've come with LGBTQ rights in our country. And what he really ended with was hope that as far uh, as much change still needs to happen, he reflected on how much change has actually happened. And we have to grasp that and build on that hope and continue to move forward with um, all the ways that we have failed in our goals and aspirations of the civil rights movement. And it was a wonderful taking stock of um, how we have advanced, but a hard dead on look at where um, injustice still lives in so many ways, so many structural ways in our society. And um, he just really spoke to hope and to um, making sure we pay attention to where we have changed. And so I do believe art can wake us up to injustice and can inspire each of us to, to think about what can we each do to move that arc of uh, justice forward. And we'll talk about that a little bit at the end of the program. Thank you, Lori. Any other thoughts? Um, I just want to point to what you said, Lori. You said former governor, Deval Patrick. In other words, there was a black governor of Massachusetts. When I was a child, black people couldn't vote where, where my mother was born and where I had to spend my summers. Um, I don't know if you recall, but the, I think the very second speech I gave at the Rockwell talked about how I had to pee in a bottle on the way down to visit my, my grandmother in North Carolina and, and how the whole previous night was spent cooking chicken because we didn't know where we could get any food. And it was a 12 hour ride. So um, I do think of, you know, how much is yet to come, but there's no way I'll forget the fact that we've accomplished so much. It's just not as fast 
as, as it should be and as we want it to be. And as I said, 50 years between um, the problem we all live with and the Ferguson riots. It's, I just, I, I, I hoped when I was a kid that we would solve everything and now here we are and we've just done this much, but you know what? It's better than nothing. We, we, we are definitely moving forward in this world. And perhaps to your point, 60 years later, we have Vice President Kamala Harris. Yes, absolutely. So, um, we do have to note the markers of progress as right. well as how far we still must go. A absolutely. Francis, would you like to contribute? Any thoughts? Yeah, I, 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 um, um, I think hope is very important and it is what propels us forward. Uh, uh, in many situations, even ones that are uh, uh, seem overwhelming and very difficult at, at a point at any given point in time. But I also don't want to mitigate uh, the current condition and how difficult it is and how uh, it affects um, uh, people of color in such a significant way. And uh, um, it's wonderful that we have uh, these examples of political leadership, uh, presidential level, vice presidential level, and many other levels. That's all progress. And uh, it's progress that we've gotten rid of some of the most uh, ridiculous signs of uh, racial bias, but let's not kid ourselves. There's something deeply, deeply wrong where um, we, where uh, our uh, citizens, our, um, uh, our society or an important part of our society lives with appropriate fear. And uh, uh, um, uh, that's, that's not, that's not, does, that's not, can't begin to be okay. And I'm just afraid if we congratulate ourselves on important progress, but that we lose the moment and uh, a real understanding of, of, of what's going on. And, uh, um, you know, we have so many tragedies that we talked about tonight. We have, you know, more tragedies, the Asian community, um, you know, the bias against the Asian community goes back into the 1800s. A lot of people don't even know about it. Um, uh, just as, as, as many African-Americans were, were hung, so were Asian-Americans, uh, uh, much in the same way. So um, uh, we still have a very serious, very serious problem in which we cannot tolerate, and we cannot let to, to persist. Well, Francis, I would add to that uh, gender-based issues and faith-based issues that there continue to be um, tremendous pressures and forces um, to support a, a dominant long-standing culture in our country. Right, I mean, I think the conundrum is we take two steps forward and we take two steps backwards. And, and, and to Pops and Lori's point, the progress that has been made, absolutely. I, I think notwithstanding, you know, I think about the shoulders that I stand on, right? The people who came before me. And um, I think I derive my hope from individuals like Ruby Bridges, who as a little girl, she weathered that all by herself and the psychological impact all, and of all of that. And back in those days, it was more overt right, in, in cases like that. I think right now what we have is a, it's, a, it's a psychological fight. And I think the, issue, the, the things that we're seeing and the images around us that goes back again to the power of images, right? It plays on your psyche, the desensitization of, 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 of folks when they see images of brutality all the time, right? What, what happens to the, the mind and, and your heart when you see constantly images of black and brown people being brutalized, right? over and over after a while it starts to numb and you start to get used to it and we never want to get used to that in our society we never want to get to that point and so we have to realize that images can either inspire or they can also have a negative effect as well um and it's something that we it's a balancing act and i think that's that's 
the most realest part about this is that we have to recognize that there are gains, but we have a lot of work to do. And um, we have to constantly think about the next generation and what we want for them. Um, speaking of thoughts, we actually have another question um, in the chat. What do you think Norman Rockwell would, uh, would think of these powerful reinvented images by Pop? I'm looking at you, Lori. <laughs> Thank you, Roberta. I'm looking at you, Pops. You know, Rockwell was a learner his whole life and he was a keen observer. He lived within the structures of the publishing world at the time and the dominant uh, systems of power and what were uh, dictated, what could be published on the covers or not. But what I observe that for any artist who for 65 years could continue to keep his pulse on, the, on change in the nation, that um, he would see the world uh, the way that you are seeing it pops today. And we'll see that in the last image we'll show of his work that I believe was his emblematic hope for all of humanity. So I think he'd be thrilled to know that he's inspired a new generation of artists and in particular um, to see a world that was living the inclusivity, uh, at least in um, your imagination, but in many parts of our nation that just, wasn't possible and didn't exist fully in his time. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. Um, well, I don't think we have any additional- um, one, There's one more question in we, the- We do. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Let's see. Well, there's a couple questions. Um, right. One right. question speaks of losing the moment. Francis, I think you were addressing yeah. this. What do you think is the best way to keep up the momentum gained in the past year? What's the best way to continue pressing for change from here? And this is, I think, what you were speaking to, Francis. Well, I, I, I yeah, I mean, uh, um, I, I think that uh, there, there are lots of things that are going on uh, um, that, that could, could, could help. Uh, there's a lot of personal commitment. Uh, um, a lot of organizations and companies are are having uh, um, uh, programs for for their people about uh, uh, institutional bias and how to understand it and how to, to fight against it. Um, uh, I think uh, um, uh, you know this experience of of being close to and understanding uh, all aspects of the problem. Um, and the emotions involved. Because I think that for the average person, um, you know, if, if one thinks about things in terms of practical problems, that's kind of on one level. But I think on an emotional level, that really um, uh, is, an, is, is something that a lot of people can connect with in a very visceral way. Uh, and I, so I think, uh, you know, thank goodness that Pops is so expressive of his emotions uh, because it's, 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 it's moving and uh, I think uh, it's the kind of thing that will continue to resonate in people's minds uh, um, in, in, in a way that um, uh, will inform people's actions and paths and commitment in the future. Um, so I think uh, um, talking about these issues, understanding not only the practical effect, but the emotional effect and, and, and the, and the long-term uh, um, trauma that caused by, uh, um, you know, I, I'm talking with friends of color in, in reaction to uh, um, some of the, recent police atrocities and, and, and experiencing their emotions in addition to their sort of outrage is, 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 is very telling and I think will help make sure that um, nobody puts down this baton and uh, um, we push forward with the change that needs to occur. Can I just say thank God for the camera phones? I think that one of the things that has um, propelled the moment has been the, I mean, the availability of video um, 
uh, camera phones as well as um, the ones that the cops wear. Mm -hmm. And uh, because the truth is in those videos and uh, why in the world are they only letting 20 seconds of that latest video be seen and only by the family? You know, um, it's, the truth will come out. Those videos will come out. And when people actually do see, that's when they understand. So um, it's not only the art, you know, it's the, the newsreel footage and, and, what's the, and the readily available um, ability of people to show others what they experience. That is really going to propel the moment. That's what I believe. Well said, well said. Yes, um, I, I think, you know, in terms of not losing momentum, I, I think that, you know, to follow up on both of your points, again, um, it's the, you know, it's to follow up the, the, a, the um, statements of intent with action, right? Um, because that's really gonna keep the momentum going. I think, you know, in the wake of George Floyd's death, what we saw was this outpouring of um, emotion and corporations and organizations put out a host of statements. And I think, People are looking now, people are looking to say, okay, are you continuing that same energy? Are you continuing to keep that momentum? And so it's gonna take everyone in their own sphere, whether you work in a, in a company, or whether you are an individual um, at a nonprofit, wherever, whatever you can do as an individual, as part of the collective to keep that energy going, I think that's something that we all have to be mindful of. And again, back to the images that we see tonight, that's where we get inspired, right? Because we're trying to unpack all that implicit bias and replace it with images of hope. Um, we have so many questions. So I, I do wanna, um, I wanna be mindful of the time, um, but I also know that folks have some really great questions. So um, I do want to uh, speak to this last one. It says, can the panelists speak to the impact of POP's images of racial and criminal justice, specifically thinking of power of the images when shared on social media by millennials and Gen, 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 Gen Z, Gen, folks of the Gen Z generation. Gen Zers. <laughs> I was going to say that, but then I was like, that doesn't sound too right. I'm Gen, Gen Z's. X. I'm Gen X, so I'm like Gen Zers. Okay. Gen Z's. Well, I, you know, Roberta, I thought, uh, Pops, you made a wonderful point about the real-time videos that people hold in their hands now with our smartphone cameras. And these are documentary filmmakers in a way, and it speaks to the power of images, whether they're curated, crafted, artfully thought through images like you're making or Norman Rockwell made, or whether they're extemporaneous uh, viewers chronicling a moment, we know that the tragedy of George Floyd's death woke this nation up in a way that the nation had not awakened for decades when similar kinds of killings were going on, but invisibly and in communities and not making national news. And without the video that we each searingly saw, um, this nation might not have moved in the way that um, it has, and as you point out, Roberta, we have to keep uh, feet to the fire and ensure that um, that moment is not lost. So I think the power of images to motivate action, whether it's inspirational images of hope or whether it is just the searing images of despair, such as um, one of Norman Rockwell's paintings that you can see behind my head, Murder in Mississippi, probably his most despairing picture, when civil rights mur uh, workers were murdered in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Um, we have these terribly low moments, and then um, we find hope and resilience and, and determination and will to make things better. Well said, Lori. Well said. I think these documents also were very important. You know, as we we just come out of a period under the prior administration where um, the narrative was contrary to reason and facts, mm -hmm. and um, that is a very very distorting experience. I mean, it wasn't the first time, you know, uh, the uh, Russians and other people were using propaganda for, you know, 
decades, for 100 years. But it was the first time we as Americans, or at least first time recently that we experienced it. So on the one hand, when we talk about Gen X, we have these younger people in our society who lived through this uh, period of irreality where, you know, uh, two was made to be five and five was made to be something else. Um, so the importance of these images and the truths that they document is to fight this false narrative, which was perpetuated by uh, um, uh, uh, by social media, by by me media generally, who who gave allowed these falsehoods to be given voice. Mm. Uh, now, thank God, we've uh, finally um, uh, are in a moment in which we're looking at uh, um, the limits of free speech and saying, "Well, wait a minute, you know, we can't just." Make up uh, um, narratives that have that, that are lies, uh, and uh, do and 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 particularly when they endanger other people, and in fact endanger the very demo the, the democratic principles that are central to the American experience. So uh, um, I think these images are doubly important because of how they. Uh, um, uh, uh, create a counterpoint to the uh, uh, distorting narrative that you know, we've been exposed to recently. A absolutely, Francis. Yes, we, we know that there was definitely a campaign of not only misinformation, but disinformation, and that not only included text, but also images, right? But we can trust what we see, right? We can trust what we see, and that's why images are so important, because we can relate. Um, we have a lot of great questions in the chat and um, I'm going to pivot to one question um, and then we're going to go to the one um, that is asking Pops about his uh, something a little bit about his background and how he conceives his work. But before we get to that Pops, what can art institutions like museums do to further social justice issues within their galleries? Laurie, I'm looking at you. Roberta, thank you. Well, I would just say everyone who's participating in this conversation tonight and the partnership um, our museum has with Pops and his art in this contemporary moment and with the Greenberger Center for Criminal and Social Justice are ways that museums are working in the world to hold the current conversation. Uh, to put the art on the walls that inspire social change, to um, propel it into our educational curriculum and our, our uh, learnings with young people. And what I especially love doing is bringing people together in conversation like tonight, where we look at these contemporary issues and we find common ground to talk about them. Uh, so these are all ways that institutions can work um, programmatically. I would say that every business in this country also has to look at its infrastructure. It has to look at all of its policies, its hiring practices, its ways that it does business in the world with its vendors, with its investments, um, with thinking about how it wields its and invests its assets to what kind of art we collect. Um, through every business and company can ask these questions and say, are we making space for everyone? Or are we living within the structures that have been the dominant structures that not only we're most comfortable in, we're just maybe not even aware of stepping outside of those boundaries because it's the way we've always operated. So we must ask questions all the time about are we making place in the world in our systems and structures actually um, going beyond because it's very hard to uh, push past the inertia of a system that has been in place for a very long time. So there's a lot that organizations can do, museums and all kinds of art organizations, but truly literally every business. And that comes down to an individual level of asking uh, what can each of us do and how do we hold daily awareness where injustice exists and asking what might we do? When, when can we speak up? When we see injustice, do we say something? Do we, um, tolerate the remark a friend makes that 
shows prejudice or do we find the courage to find a way to stand up to it and invite another perspective or to say it's not acceptable to me to hear you know someone talk in that way so um, there really is a lot we can do even though the systems can be very entrenched and um, have wielded power for a long time. Well, I, I, I would just like to pick up for a second on, on the theme you're raising there and uh, <laughs> use this occasion because you know the Greenberger Center is, is, is a lot of what it's about is fighting mass incarceration and, uh, um, and in particular uh, with regard to people who end up in the criminal justice system because of mental health issues. And I would like to inspire Pops to think about whether that's a theme he might want to further uh, take a look at in his work uh, um, and uh, maybe address it at some point. I don't want to put you on the spot, Pops, but. Well, well Francis, that's like the perfect segue because we had two questions asking Pops about, does he want to teach others um, who want to do social justice art? And, and so in this one particular comment, um, this, um, we, this um, poster, her son is both a young photographer and a social justice worker. So that's for you, Pops. Are you helping um, young artists um, manifest their social justice um, um, you know, interests? Well, there's nothing really uh, between all the, um, all the artwork and all the wonderful things that I've been able to do in the past several years. I've never enjoyed anything more than speaking to young people in schools and inspiring them to um, express themselves. And not only that, to recognize and appreciate the sacrifices and actions of all the artists who have come before them through the decades, people who without them, we would not be here. You know, people like Gordon Parks and Josephine Baker and even Harriet Beecher Stowe, people who put themselves on the line, people who, who realize that it is up to every single one of us to create the world that we want to live in. And, um, you know, I really got to say, Justin Bieber has a Martin Luther speech, a Martin Luther King excerpt on his latest album, in which King says, if, you, if there's nothing in your life that you want to die for, then you're already dead, you know? And um, I really take that to heart. And I also want to point to the fact that music works that way. And like Justin Bieber is somebody who really does believe in equality and, and social justice. And, and he took that moment, that one moment, all he, wanted, all he had to do was make people dance. But no, he wants people to think and to grow. So he included that speech. So um, yeah, um, the, most, the, the, the most gratifying thing that I do is to encourage young people. And um, I'm looking forward to whatever opportunities come along that I can well, give my speeches on um, arts and civil rights. Well, I, I think that's one of the most powerful takeaways is that we may not be a Justin Bieber. I'm not a Justin Bieber, um, but I know that I have a platform, albeit small, and I think that if we all use our sphere of influence to work with what we have, that's how we affect change, right? We think about, person, we think exactly, person, we you know, have to change your child, where we're, your yes, neighbor. You absolutely. don't put up with that, you know? That's right. Somebody made a, made a comment and, oh, he doesn't know if he's a boy or he's a girl and you go, snark, snark, snark. You don't put up with that. You mm. say, well, you know, they have, everyone has their path to leave. Everyone has their challenge. How dare you? How dare you put somebody down hmm. for their yes. own challenge? No, I and don't put up with it in your life. Absolutely. We all we all have a opportunity to use our voice and our platform, whatever it may be. Um, Pops, I, I do have one more question for you, and then I think that's gonna round out our, our questions, but just talk a little bit about um, how you conceive and produce your, your art, the technical part of your artistry in terms of your medium and your models. What is the intention and the rationale behind your decisions? Well, I, as I said, with this series, I wanted to make painting photos because I'm into digital. I'm digital. I can't <laughs> do the, the oil thing. I mean, I studied it, but digital is just so much more um, easy and affordable and you can circulate it better. And also you can give away your painting and still have the exact same painting. So I like to do digital and okay. um, 
the technique, you know, that's something that really only other artists or photographers would really understand. But what inspires me is the world. For instance, I have a, a, a really good friend. She actually is my assistant in the salon and she's Japanese and she came in just so upset about all the violence against Asian women at that point, but Asian men and women that's happening today and how, and I could see the fear on her face and, and it, it really struck me. So my new picture is, is based on that fear. So do, do we have that image? Could we show that right now? I think as we're segueing to the next, um, I'm, I'm not sure if we have that image handy. Well, um, anyway, if you do bring it, it's, okay. and I wanted to show just like freedom from what, okay. how it internalizes in everybody's, you know, in your daily life. You know, it's not the act of violence that's so important. It's outrageous, but it's, and it's wrong, but that's not really where the change happens, I don't think. It's when you realize that somebody, when they're walking home by themselves, they might have to hold their keys in their hand because there are people coming up behind them and they're afraid, you know, they can't just walk home. Oh, there we oh, go. Okay. So this is in progress. This is not a finished work, but, but I felt that, you know, and I saw that in my mind and um, people are responding very well to it. When it's done, I'll be, I'm going to be very proud of this. This is actually, uh, you know, I've got the Rockwell style of presenting a picture, but this is actually based, inspired by a uh, monk screen. So um, yeah, it, they, I never know when the inspiration is gonna come, but when it comes, I know exactly what I wanna say and how to say it. And that's what every artist needs to do. They have to you know, visualize their own heart. Perfect, thank you so much, Pops. We're At this time, one more picture. The, uh, we, we're gonna close it out now with the golden rule and freedom of faith. All right, so as we've done um, at the beginning of our program, we're gonna take a minute to let um, review the images and, um, and then they'll be followed by remarks from Lori. All right, Lori. Thank you, Roberta. This image published in 1961 in the Saturday Evening Post is really the arc from Norman Rockwell's Four Freedoms to a work he worked on to try to portray the ideals of the United Nations and a world at peace following the war uh, to the beginning of his civil rights movement works. And here he is portraying a world at peace, representing all races, all ethnicities, all religions. There are many, many kinds of prayer symbols in this um, picture, uh, a Torah, a rice bowl, rosary beads, um, different headgear. Uh, I believe this was Rockwell's homage to a common humanity, uh, really a universal soul, a universal spirit and represents his love of all peoples. I think one of the reasons he was such a successful artist is his love for people comes through his paintings, his kindness and his hopefulness and optimism. And so this one of the last paintings he did for the Saturday Evening Post, just before he began working for Look Magazine, doing his civil rights image paintings, I think stands as one of his great symbols to humanity. Thank what you, Laurie. What I like Laurie. to say about Pop. this is that um, what artists know is that every painting is a self-portrait. And if you will examine Norman Rockwell's works, you will understand how loving he was, how much joy he had, how he cared for other people and how he wanted the world to be a, a beautiful place where people get along. And um, that's so shown right here. And, and I'm surprised that that was a Saturday Evening Post image because as we know, um, the Saturday Evening Post prevented him from showing people of color through the years. He worked with them for 47 years. So it started a very, very long time ago when uh, racism was, you know, quite the thing. And um, he was only allowed to show people of color in menial positions, if at all. But he always wanted to sneak one in here and there. Um, and so obviously he was very glad to have this opportunity to actually show all the people of the world getting along together as brothers. 
in my version, this is my version um, actually of freedom of religion, which was done back in the 40s. So this, the, the, um, the golden rule was 1961. So like 20, 25 years later, he was allowed to do this, but in freedom of religion, there are very few religions represented, represented and also very few skin tones. So I wanted to do my version of freedom of religion, showing all the different religions we have right here in our hometown. So everyone here is, a, is from the Berkshires. Um, they rep there's a black Jew, there's Hindus on the bottom, there's Roberta McCulloch Jews as a Baptist, right? And then we have a spiritualist, we have um, a, a, black, a Baptist priest, we have a Jewish person, we have a, a nun, and then on the lower right corner, we have an atheist. So I wanted to show everybody with um, faith being equal and, every, and show that everyone's entitled to, to worship as they please, and we should all respect one another's religions. Um, Thank you, Pops. Okay. Thank you. Well said analysis from both of you. And I want to thank everyone, all the panelists. We're going to now hear from Lori, um, who will provide closing remarks. For, for I think this was a great dynamic conversation. And I think if we could go on and on, it would be great, but we can't. <laughs> so we have to get out of Zoom land. So Lori, the floor is yours. Roberta, thank you. Thank you for a beautiful job moderating tonight and the thoughtfulness of your questions and how you carried this conversation through the images and to my fellow panelists also for your very thoughtful um, and thought provoking, inspiring remarks. Uh, we'd like to leave you tonight. Um, Cheryl spoke in the beginning about the, the goals and mission of the Greenberger Center and Norman Rockwell Museum. We'd like to leave you each with a question to think about how has art inspired you to lead social change, even first within yourself and maybe within your family and then within your community or whatever communities of influence that you uh, wield? And how might um, you take that out into the world um, to, pro to propel forward um, social change and social good. We hope this program tonight has inspired you to see how artists of each of uh, their generations, Pops Peterson and Norman Rockwell, um, really have wielded their artistic power to invite question and to help us see injustice and really also portray hope. And I hope it's helped you think too about what institutions can do like the Greenberger Center or the work at Norman Rockwell Museum. And, and Roberta, thank you for being a trustee of the museum as well as our head of our education and program committee. Um, together, we can all make a difference. And I hope that each of you tonight who has tuned in uh, will just take that question away with you and say, what can I do? So thank you. We've had a robust attendance um, throughout this program. It's gone a little bit longer than we had expected. So thank you for staying with us and for caring so much about making the world a better place. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night and thank you so much.